This is College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero, Jr., a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. Hello, everybody. And when we talk about history, we can tell a lot of stories about history, Mm -hmm. Uh, how we came from different places in terms of the background, the politics, and everything else. Mm-hmm. And today we have Dr. Catherine Pence with us to talk about the specific area in which she has been working for quite a while, European mm-hmm. history, more specifically Germany, That's right. and, and all that. So Dr. Catherine Pence, who is today the chair and associate professor in the Department of History at the uh, Weizmann School of Arts and Sciences in Baruch College, City University of, of New York, was born in Oxford, England, but That's don't right. get fooled, she doesn't have a British accent. <laughs> uh, and uh, she got her bachelor's from Pomona College, very right. nice pr- liberal, pr- uh, uh, private uh, liberal arts college in mm-hmm. California, and a master and doctorate from the University of Michigan. And today we're gonna have a nice conversation with you about all these uh, historical aspects. Now, let's begin by, and if you're going a little bit closer to the microphone, but it, uh, the fact that this perception that many people have that History or historians is about remembering places and dates, mm-hmm. but history is much more than that, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, first of all, for having me here. I'm really happy to talk about history because I find it a very exciting thing that helps us to understand the present and figure out how to analyze all the different things around us. So you can always look up a date, and it's good to have a few dates in mind so you can figure out um, causes and effects and what comes before and after a certain date, such as, let's say, the end of World War II. Um, That that was a, a very important date, 1945, and the world changed dramatically after that date. But you can always look those things up. The most important thing, I think, is to figure out how to analyze um, what was going on in the past, in my mind, in order to deconstruct and figure out wh- how we got to where we are today. So for me, it's a liberating kind of enterprise because there are a lot of things that we take for granted today as common sense. And if we look at the historical origins of them, we are kind of liberated from, from those things because you re- recognize that it wasn't always that way. There was a particular point in time in which certain ideas um, evolved over time and got us to the present. So if you look at the historical origins, you can start to break apart some of the, the things that might be discriminatory or you know, limiting to people. Now, talking about history, tell us about your own personal history. Do you remember the moment when you said, history is for me? Yeah, well, I always wanted to be a teacher. I loved school and was always interested in, in the idea of being a teacher. And I have a lot of teachers in my family, so I, I consider it to be a great profession. Um, and I was drawn to German history. I do have German heritage. My um, ancestors came over in the 19th century. And I studied German language in um, both middle school and high school. And I remember certain things like um, the way that people talked about Germany in terms of the Nazi period, how prominent that was in people's memory. For example, when I was in elementary school, there was a little kid named Uwe Wiggenhauser, and his name was spelled U-W-E, and everyone called him Yui. They didn't know how to pronounce his name. And even in elementary school, these kids were calling him a Nazi because he was German. And I just thought it was very interesting to think about how do you uh, recover as a country from that sort of cataclysmic uh, destruction of democracy? And so I've studied post-war history, particularly looking at at women and how everyday actors uh, experience big changes in political regimes and events to to figure that out. When I was in college, I knew I wanted to do something in the humanities. And so I tried out a bunch of different um, classes in sociology, psychology, and they're all very interesting. But what I liked was um, how history allows you to look at all different kinds of sources, whether it's literature or statistical data or, you know, material objects. And to, to analyze those historically, I think, provides us with a lot of fertile ground to understand where we are today. 
Now, <clears throat> one the area in which you have concentrated a lot of your academic efforts is the reunification of Germany between East Germany and West Germany. Turns that for many people today sound like uh, really that w w were they divided, right? And that brings me to a question that sometimes some people pose to hist historians: that is, how can you really study history of such a recent events mm. when you don't have the context or the perspective mm -hmm. uh, that time can provide? Mm -hmm. Well, my um, the bulk of my research has been has been on the 1950s and the Cold War, and then recent, more recently I've been looking at the 1960s. And so those weren't periods that I lived through myself, but I have also been, like you say, interested in uh, the 1980s when reunification happened and what is the legacy of East Germany, for example? How do people try to remember it? You, c you can apply the principles of historical investigation to even recent history by analyzing sources that are available to you. Um, one of the great things that you can do is interview participants and try to get a variety of different perspectives through oral history. And so studying contemporary history is actually um, I think a very worthwhile exercise and you'd be surprised how quickly people forget things that happened only a decade ago so yeah. it's it's still worthwhile to use historical methods to to figure those things out for those of us who lived through the reunification of Germany mm -hmm. it was viewed at that time as a very joyful Mm -hmm. Event because it was basically the end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. um, the, the end of this tension between East and West. Um, but it also was a traumatic event mm -hmm. for many Germans, especially for East Germans. Mm -hmm. is, is that a correct interpretation? Well, I think that nobody really wanted the um, East German regime back um, because it was a repressive regime. It didn't allow for free speech or free association, a lot of the um, uh, freedoms that we you know, uh, adhere to in the United States. Um, and people recognize that. However, there were a lot of things that happened in reunification in which um, East Germans felt increasingly disenfranchised. A lot of West German companies came in and took over their properties. They had to, the, the factories that were state owned were taken over by West German companies. And in a lot of cases, East Germans who had been guaranteed work were now unemployed. And so they felt the, the brunt of that economic dislocation. And how that e exhibited itself was not in sort of a political nostalgia for the communist regime, but in a sort of celebration of what had developed as a separate East German culture through products. And um, in Germany, they called it ostalgie or nostalgia for the East. And so... I see it as sort of a way for that East Germans were trying to reassert um, an identity and um, really point out how they weren't just v pure victims of a regime, but they also had their own integrity and um, uh, they they were developing a culture that was somewhat separate from uh, West Germans and also had gained a lot of strength in navigating the strictures of both the difficult political situation and also the constraints of a shortage economy, in which a lot of things were not available a lot of the time. They figured out really ingenious ways to work around the limited um, opportunities they had on the market. So, Do you think that in certain ways the East Germans missed the paternalistic state, the sense that there is this government is going to take care of us and we don't mm -hmm. have to really worry too much about A, B, or C? Well, certainly they, you know, when they were experiencing unemployment and high prices on the rental market and things like that, it really brings home the way that um, capitalist economies don't necessarily um, take care of everybody equally. And so I think there was some concern about how, uh, particularly things like child care. There was, was a uh, movement at the, in 1989 for, among East German feminists to work with West Germans and create some sort of a hybrid between their systems for things like care for children. And that didn't really happen. And um, it was really that the West German system completely took over the East German system. So I think there wasn't enough collaboration necessarily to make sure that some of the um, social welfare provided by the 
uh, socialist state would be safeguarded. You mentioned earlier that one of the things that the East Germans learned was to go around the system mm -hmm. to make things happen. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the first thought that you have about that is the black market. Right. How to find all that sort of things. And that re when I read that in your resume that you have published on that particular area, it reminded me when I visited the Soviet Union mm -hmm. in the late 60s, mm -hmm. which obviously, by the way I was wearing things, yeah. I was a foreigner. Right. And people came to me to offer me money for my blue jeans. Right, yeah. And <laughs> things of that nature, and they have another par pair of pants mm -hmm. to, that I can wear. And until you don't live in, through that experience, do, you don't realize how extensive that black market exists. Yeah. And I suppose, in a way, uh, in order not, not to create further political problems, some of those regimes allow that black market to happen so they look the other way so mm -hmm. people don't feel that oppressed. Was that the case in East Germany as well? I think it was a little bit of a safety valve. So when the system itself couldn't um, function adequately to provide people with the consumer goods that they desired, that having this other sort of informal network to to attain goods was um, was useful. And what I have examined in in my research is how women, in particular, were very adaptive and innovative in figuring out how to provide for their, themselves and their families um, through a variety of different means, including the black market. Now, if you were to explain to the people who never knew exactly what the difference was, difference was, how would you differentiate the daily life in the mm -hmm. among the common citizen between an East German and a West German before reunification? Well, historians have done a lot of work to try to analyze um, daily life in the East German system, and one of the things that has come out is the idea of Eigensinn, which is sort of a a uh, personal will or stubbornness in which people assert their own ideas, even in a context in which the government is trying to tell you how you're supposed to be a certain way. So the government had a, um, eliminated a lot of aspects of civil society. They got rid of independent clubs, for example, and you were supposed to join the communist mass organizations like the um, Young Pioneers for Children. Um, and brigades for work, and there's a bunch of different ways in which the state really tried to get everyone on board with their project. So a lot of people participated in that, and, and but there's a variety of different ways that they would have experienced it. And so they maybe made some of those experiences their own, and in other ways they might have resisted in small measures by just asserting their own per personal identities um, in, in their friendship groups or... Um, or, you know, just in various ways that sort of uh, asserted private life. The state was trying to kind of intrude into private life, and um, people still asserted their own private identities as much as they, as they could. So I think the tension between this state that was trying to be all-encompassing and individuals and groups that were asserting themselves um, was a really interesting tension. So I like to look at it not as that just the people were subject to the state or um, didn't have any options, but that they, they still developed their own sense of self. Today we are seeing in Europe, throughout Europe, uh, increasing activity of more extremist groups, mm -hmm. uh, mostly populist types, uh, right, right groups, uh, far yeah. right groups and uh, all they like. And I was wondering, to what extent do you think that that division of Germany for many years now has had some kind of influence in, in those ideologies? Mm -hmm. Because obviously there are some people who feel, as you mentioned earlier, some kind of nostalgia for the state. And they may say, well, communism, maybe with a different name, is what we need now. And other people who say, you know, what we need is the Nazi type uh, mm -hmm. of regime. Yeah. Do you think that in any, in any, anyhow, uh, that difference between the two Germanies has influenced this type of ideologies that are reflourishing today? Mm -hmm. Well, there, I don't think anybody is nostalgic for the communist regime in, in Germany. Um, I think that there is a lot of dissatisfaction with how the, um, how the, 
current political situation is is working through it the problems of today, such as um, you know what what to do with migrants from other places. Germany has traditionally been very welcoming of asylum seekers and migrants. Um, it wasn't until the 1990s that they offered uh, the large minority of like Turkish guest workers full citizenship. So they had they've had some mixed ideas about that, but Germany has has been changing, and there are some people who feel um, that the economic strains of reunification um, is exacerbated by an influx of refugees. And so Germany, I, I think, politically has tried to maintain a welcoming attitude, but there are some people that are asserting um, this, this populist, racist kind of um, agenda. I don't think that's necessarily um, isolated to the former East German population because there were, immediately after reunification, the rise of some nationalist groups in East Germany, but there were also some attacks on Muslim populations in West Germany. So that happened in both places. And I think a lot of it's just like the the transition that Germany's been going through. Um, Germany has emerged as a major leader in Europe, and so hopefully it will continue to maintain this stance of openness that it's been really working towards um, since reunification. To what extent do you think that this openness has to do with some sense of guilt mm -hmm. for what Germany was until mm -hmm. 1945 versus with the research that shows that actually immigration is good for the economy mm -hmm. and that's the major strength of Germany? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Germany, I think since the 1970s, it took them a while, has been very open about confronting um, the, the responsibility for the Holocaust and has made it a, a major aspect of the educational system to really think through uh, this past and what it, what it has meant for Germany in the 20th century. And they call this the mastering of the German past or, you know, sort of grappling with it. Vergangenheitsbewältigung is, is the term. So they've really been trying to work, work that through much more so than, say, the United States has with its history of slavery. I think that that's, you know, something that the Germans have been really concertedly focusing on just in the past couple of decades. Um, so I think that trying to maintain this openness to the world is a way in some, in some respects to atone for those past um, legacies of fascism, yeah. More recently, they have been emphasizing the economic benefits right. mm -hmm. of doing that, plus the very fact that um, as most European countries, the native, so to speak, uh, showing a decrease in the, in the demographics of, mm -hmm. the, of the country itself. Yes, definitely. I mean, Germany, um, West Germany got full employment at, with its booming economy in 1955, and they started to invite migrant workers from Turkey and Italy Southern Europe, Greece also, and they expected those workers to go back home. Of course, they didn't. They um, came to work and then established families in Germany, and like I said, it wasn't until the 1990s that they were offered full citizenship. Um, even their children were called Mitbürger or co-citizens. So um, I think there has been a lot of mixed feelings about um, immigration to Germany, despite the fact that they have uh, had official policies to welcome in um, immigrants. And it is becoming much more multicultural there today, um, especially in the larger cities. And so there's been a greater embrace of that kind of multiculturalism and an ongoing commitment to welcoming of asylum seekers from uh, Bosnia, from Afghanistan, from the Middle East, etc. Okay. Talking about mixed feelings, uh, when reunification took place, not everybody in Europe was happy about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Polish, in particular, were really afraid that a reunified Germany will try to reclaim now mm -hmm. the territories that they lost in 1945 right. to, to Poland and all that. Do you have a sense that especially Eastern Europe, feels now more comfortable mm -hmm. with the current uh, state of affairs in Germany in comparison with what happened right after reunification? Um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, not only um, Eastern Europe, but also a major sort of rival for power in uh, Western Europe, France, is nervous about the the power of a, ma- of a big Germany. But Germany has... Um, was occupied by the victorious powers after 1945 and went through a process of really integrating itself into the European Union and play, was a major player in that kind of, of diplomatic and economic unity and also limiting its military strength or at least um, having it be part of this unified force. Um, So I think Germany has not really made any moves to assert itself militarily or, and there's also been until the last just few years, a reluctance to even um, wave the the, uh, German flag. So when they they won the World Cup a few years back, they started waving the German flag again. And recently there's been some nationalists that have brought back the Kaiser's flag, which is worrisome. But overall, the sort of hyper-nationalism that you saw in the Nazi period has not been um, such a big thing. So I don't think that militarily there there is a uh, a, an effort to yeah um, keep going. Militarily, it's not an effort to take over Eastern Europe. However, I would say that what Germany has done is is have a rising strength economically. Um, In the 50s, they called it the Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle. And what you can see in Eastern Europe today is the triumph of German products. All throughout Eastern Europe, when the reunification happened, German products moved in. And so that is where they have become a a major power. And there might be mixed feelings about the effect of that on on the local economies. For those of you who are watching the video, we have for a few (laughs) seconds a blackout. That is because the light that we have here is is reacts to motion motion sensors, and Mm -hmm. we were not moving at all. And that's why it it went it went went dark. That's also another good lesson from Germany. They've been leaders in environmentalism, and so every um, room in German buildings would have those motion sensors on there. So it's just in in the spirit of uh, the German. Movement. Along the lines of what you were mentioning earlier, I don't think most Americans know that in Germany, in fact, there are very strict laws mm-hmm. against any s- symbolism of, of the Nazi era right. and all that. And even when the uh, uh, the book by Hitler, My, My Struggle, Kampf, yeah. Mein Kampf, uh, the rights expired that so it could be published, it was a big controversy mm-hmm. about that, and mm-hmm. actually the edition that was published was heavily annotated mm-hmm. to make sure that nobody f- uh, fell into these alternative facts yeah. <laughs> about the history of Germany. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really interesting how um, they have, you know, they're they're generally in favor of freedom of speech, but when it comes to uh, allowing these explicit expressions of fascism, it is it is absolutely banned. Zero, zero yeah, yeah, you can't have the swastika. Um, or uh, the Nazi salute or yeah. any, any of that stuff. Right. So yeah. it's interesting to think about in the American context um, whether, you know, how, how much freedom of speech, um, it, you know, are there ways in which freedom of speech can be problematic. I think that their Germany's looked at um, America and sort yeah. of thought about that. The other thing when you mentioned about militarism, uh, a lot of Americans don't know that we have a large number of troops mm. stationed in Germany. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And th- that's not a problem for them. In, in, a, in a way, they see like kind of, that means that we don't have to spend too much in, in military power and not to look like we are going back to the old times, but mm-hmm. because we have someone else taking care of us. Right, yeah. Well, um, uh, until the wall fell in 1989, um, Germany was still occupied by American and British um, and Soviet troops. And um, my first experience in Germany was in 1989 um, in the spring before the wall came down, and I was living in um, West Berlin, mm-hmm. and there were American troops all over the place. Yes. So that was, it was you know, really interesting to, to have such a large military presence there that um, I wouldn't even experience in the United States. So um, there's been a very close relationship between the U.S. and Germany um, from that from that time, and that's continued on as, part, you know, we have this very close strategic collaboration yeah. with our European partners, and so that's something that, you know, 
has been stabilizing in Europe after the war. Well, in the minute and a half that we have left, I wanted to ask you what kind of a uh, project are you embarked right now? What are you working? I'm working on a project about Germany's relationship with Africa during the 1960s uh. to examine how the Cold War and decolonization decolonization fit together, and specifically there were some mobile exhibitions that uh, the West Germans uh, put on in a variety of African countries. These trucks rolled throughout the, the countries and displayed what West Germany was all about in education system, politically, etc. They had a display of the Berlin Wall, and they were trying to gain uh, partners and allies in, in Africa. So there was a lot of hopefulness about Africa in its new future as um, uh, these newly independent countries coming out from imperialism. And I think uh, Germany was interested in hooking its own future as a demilitarized post-Nazi state to the future of this new Africa. Well, that's very interesting because actually you probably saw in this past few weeks there have been some articles about the issue of Germans as colonizers in Africa and that they behave as badly mm -hmm. as many right. other colonizers. Yeah, so uh, they powers con there. they conveniently glossed over that past, yeah. and there was some genocide that the Germans uh, committed against the Herero um, tribe yeah. in Africa, for example. Um, and, but Germany had its colonies taken away after World War I, and yeah. the, they were given to the French and the British. Yeah. So in the 60s, the French and the British were experiencing these colonial revolutionary struggles, but Germany could conveniently just forget about yeah. it because they'd already had their colonies taken away. So exactly. they came in and said, we're going to be your partners in progress. Well, thank you very much to Dr. Catherine Pence uh, about this conversation about the recent history of Germany. And next week, we're going to have with us Dr. David Jones, uh, who is the chair of the Department of Political Science at the Westman School of Arts and Sciences, who will be talking about politics of America. So mm -hmm. stay tuned. Yes. Thank you. This has been College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero, Jr., a production of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College, all rights reserved. 2017.